When you think of cryptocurrency, what comes to mind? Perhaps it's an insurance policy against a broken financial system that seems bound to fail at some point. For many of you, it might be money made or more likely money lost since crypto exploded in popularity less than a half decade ago. Or maybe you wonder if it's the latest in a countless parade of financial grifts throughout human history. That latter idea is something Ben McKenzie has been pursuing diligently for two years. Ben, who is an Austin native and renowned actor by day, has been asking critical questions about crypto's legitimacy through the highs of 2021 and a bursting of the bubble since. And he's written a book about it, co-authored with Jacob Silverman. It's already achieved New York Times bestseller status less than a month since its release. It's called Easy Money, Cryptocurrency, Casino Capitalism, Golden Age of Fraud. Ben, thank you so much for the time. How are you doing today? I'm good, Trey. How are you? I'm great. And uh, what a fascinating read this was. First off, congratulations on finally getting easy money made. I know it's been a little bit more than a year and a half in the making because this book was being promoted at South by Southwest 2022. How good did it feel to uh, finally get this book out into the public, much less it turning into a New York Times bestseller? Oh, man, it feels so good. You know, Jacob and I worked our butts off. Uh, Jacob Silverman, who wrote the book with me, um, we, you know, we had a great adventure. And it's just really nice to have it out, to have it be the first sort of crypto book that's speaking truth to power. Um, and the timing is great. You know, there's still more chips to fall when it comes to crypto. So uh, I'm glad I got in ahead of the uh, head of the curve. How did the emperor's new clothes and a little bit of pot help to serve as a sort of <laughs> genesis for this book? <laughs> well, yes. So I was reading my daughter, who was six at the time, uh, The Emperor's New Clothes. And I remember the story, but I had forgotten that, you know, the tailor's trick is just to convince the adults that only the smartest people, only the people of highest station can perceive the imaginary clothes they weave. So adult after adult is tricked into to seeing these things that don't exist because they don't want to look stupid. Uh, that felt very relatable to crypto. And then uh, the second thing that I had forgotten about the story was um, at the end, as the emperor gallivants through town naked, it's a child who calls out the lie. The only one brave enough to speak truth is someone who doesn't know he's being brave. He's just speaking the truth. And it was hard not to see myself as that child. So when I was reading my daughter, the story, this was about it was two years ago, I'd been looking at crypto for about three months. Um, I was struck by that. and I couldn't get that out of my head. I just could not get it out of my head. So I am a fan of medical marijuana. I have my legal card here in the state of New York. And, uh, you know, I mean, I like alcohol too, but, you know, there's a limit to drinking. I was definitely beyond that during the pandemic. And, uh, yeah, I thought while high, I thought, well, I should write a book about this, you know, which, you know, when you're high, it feels like a really good idea. The next morning, sober, um, realized I didn't know how to write a book. And thus, I reached out to Jacob Silverman, this journalist who uh, whose work I, I appreciated. Um, and took him to drinks in Brooklyn and said, Hey man, what if we, uh, write a book? I don't know how to write about events that haven't happened yet. And, um, he was great, man. He, he jumped right in and, and we were off to the races. You started really questioning the legitimacy of crypto as the hype train was beginning to take off. What first clued you in that there was something fishy going on here? Well, it was being marketed so hard, so hard in 2021 in particular that, Anything that's being sold as like the f- the future of of it, any financial product in which they're trying to sort of give you FOMO, trying to sort of you got to buy it and you got to buy it now, is you know that's a bit of a tell. Um, I would say honestly, the first word I stumbled on was was the word currency. You know, I have a degree in economics, and I you know was a little rusty, twenty years old, but I but I was pretty sure that one of the things you could do with money is buy stuff. <laughs> and, you know, with crypto, you couldn't buy anything. You could trade it and hope to like, you know, the price would go up and you and you could cash out and make real money off of that investment. But investment and, and money are, you know, very different things. You use money to invest, but um, investments are regulated uh, under the Securities and Exchange uh, Commission. Um, but these cryptos looked more like unregulated, unlicensed securities that really hadn't been properly classified as such. And so, you know, they're being sold to the general public. There's no investor protection. They're being sold through uh, overseas exchanges like FTX, like Binance. Um, the red flags were just 
I remember thinking I was crazy and 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 somebody, I forget who clued me into this. Somebody told me you should, oh, just go to the SEC's website. There's a, there's a page for red flags for Ponzi schemes. Mm-hmm. So I did. And there is. There are seven red flags for Ponzi schemes and crypto checks off five, arguably six of the seven. <laughs> that was a real kind of holy shit moment, um, if you'll excuse my French. So yeah, I included the, the, the chart at the, uh, or the red flags in the book. But yeah, once I started going in, I just couldn't get it out of my head because it was so obvious to me. You're welcome to use whatever language you need right now. I'm happy to censor <laughs> it before it airs on the ESPN radio show tonight. So I'm glad you talked about that because something that I've done for going back almost a decade now is covered South by Southwest. I hit whatever red carpets I can, cover fest, uh, cover panels, and also trying to speak with uh, as many people as I can. And typically, as you're well aware, not only as a native of this great city, but someone who has now participated in it, South by Southwest is always operating on at least a couple of different themes. And one of those themes always has to do with the convergence of humans and technology. And in 2022, when you and Jacob had your panel discussion, by the way, I couldn't make it for whatever reason. I'm very frustrated that more people weren't attending that session. Shame on everyone that year for buying in the hype train. But one of the big subjects that year was how cryptocurrency and blockchain was about to change everything for society. And so I went around asking people just to try and find out more about this because I knew very little. What exactly is cryptocurrency and blockchain and how are they going to make things that much better? I spoke with everyone from uh, Roman Coppola to one of the guys from Run DMC, but nobody could tell me exactly why this was going to be such a game changer. Donald Glover came the closest and he was honestly uh, much more uh, toned down about what its potential was for the future, which is why I was so intrigued by what you and Jacob were doing. You were two guys who were asking, I think, legitimate questions in this sea of hysteria. So I guess I set that up to ask just how weird was your 2022 South by experience? Because based on this book, it was wild, man. It was wild, man. Yeah. The the chapter uh, devoted to that experience is entitled South by Southwest, the CIA and the 1.5 trillion that wasn't there. (laughs) Um, You know, yeah, we got like recruited by guys who said they were CIA agents. Very questionable as to whether this was true, but it led to a to a debaucherous night out. Um, as you do get drunk, getting drunk with the CIA. The next morning, I stumbled into um, like almost literally stumbled into this guy named Alex Mashinsky, who is the CEO, was the CEO of a crypto company called Celsius. Uh, interviewed him. Um, I asked him how much real money was in crypto. He said 10 to 15 percent. Um, the rest was speculation, which made my blood run cold, right? At the time, crypto was worth supposedly $1.8 trillion. So, you know, give or take, that means $1.5 trillion isn't there, hence the, the the subtitle of the book, I mean, the, the title of the chapter. And yeah, sure enough, Mashinsky, Alex Mashinsky, the guy I interviewed, uh, well, Celsius went bankrupt four months later. Uh, Mashinsky's now been indicted for fraud, um, as well as sued by the CFTC and the SEC and the New York AG. I mean, you know. Um, yeah, we visited the biggest Bitcoin mine, uh, in the country, which is in Rockdale, as you probably know. Um, it, it was a pretty wild experience. I mean, getting back to sort of what you were talking about with like people in the entertainment industry who are kind of swallowing the hype. I mean, look, some of them who were endorsing these things were being paid in real money to convince you to take your real money and turn it into something else. So I'm not imputing their motives, but like, how it works is fairly simple. As for the others who like were sort of caught up in the hoopla, I think there were people who really, the, inter, artists and entertainers were being told that uh, crypto and particularly NFTs were going to like allow them to make money because they would own, you know, the original NFT, um, uh, you know, kind of receipt for, for the NFT on the blockchain. And therefore every time it was being sold, you'd make a little piece of it. And crypto is really good at sort of being both very grandiose and very vague in its marketing. So it was like, it's going to change everything. It's going to democratize and decentralize our our financial structure. It's going to make everybody rich as well. Um, When there's easy money out there, you know, macroeconomically speaking, when interest rates are at zero, which they which they were um, uh, and would only start to go up just a few months later, you know, it's pretty easy. People just tend to gamble with the money that they're given. And all these companies get started that don't really have products, don't really have revenue streams. And, you know, it's all fine, well and good. But, you know, then the Fed starts raising interest rates and 
kablat, kablooey, you know, the whole thing blows up. Yeah, you did mention visiting that old Alcoa aluminum plant in Rockdale that had been turned into the largest crypto mining facility in the U.S. What did you learn from that trip? It was really fascinating. Yeah, so it's an Alco uh, a shuttered Alcoa aluminum smelting plant, um, and the reason it was appealing to the Bitcoin miners is that it has it can it can handle a lot of uh, uh, payload from the grid. Um, it's connected to the grid in a, in a very significant way, and so you go out there and it's just sort of warehouse after warehouse. These are like football field size warehouses of uh, computers stacked, you know, on top of one another, hundreds of feet in the air, just endlessly running over and over and over again. Um, they're, they're what's called mining Bitcoin, which means they're basically performing simple mathematical calculations over and over and over again on the random chance that they'll They'll, they'll be correct and they will be rewarded with the Bitcoin. So it's a very energy intensive. Yeah, it's, you're see you shaking your head and that's exactly right. It was dystopian. I mean, um, you go in there and uh, first of all, one of the one of the uh, uh, warehouses um, was you would step into this room where they're just stacked, you know, to the ceiling and the only vent is in the seat is is up in the ceiling and it's probably 105 degrees in there. And is there this weird um, uh, digital buzz sound like a, but like imagine that with millions of different computers, it was dystopian. And, um, you know, I talked to the guy running it at the time. I don't think he's there anymore, but he, he was saying, well, we're bringing jobs into, into this, uh, into Rockdale, which look, I mean, I'm pro jobs <laughs> who's anti jobs. But it didn't feel sustainable. It felt like, you know, eventually this was going to go sideways. And it it was obviously not good for the environment in the sense that, you know, crypto is at best a form of gambling uh, economically. It's like it's not really doing anything. It's not like it's not like these are weird investments, cryptos like they a normal investment, a share of, you know, uh, stock in a company like Apple. Well, Apple makes stuff and they have goods and services they provide. Crypto doesn't do any of that. So it's really economically speaking, like like playing poker in a casino or an online casino. Like you might win a hand, I might win a hand, or we're just passing money back and forth. Um, but to keep the game going, they got to mine all this Bitcoin. So in 2021, uh, Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies used the energy equivalent of Argentina, the entire country, to basically do nothing. I mean, it's it's pretty messed up, man. I mean, you know, I, I, I want people to have jobs, but we, we should be putting them to like useful employment, <laughs> not to, you know, basically gamble on these, these things with a huge environmental cost. Well, especially when there is such an issue with power grid strain right now, like I'm sure you're familiar with, with this, even if you weren't in the area a couple of years ago where that deep freeze uh, wrecked havoc uh, across the state of Texas. So to, have X amount of energy being utilized for something like that, especially at a time where the price was really beginning to plummet, is doing a great disservice to society on the whole. 100%. And the other thing that people really need to understand is that the, the existence of the mine raises your electricity costs, mm -hmm. everyone's. It forms the base layer of the costs there. So you are paying more in electricity. Every citizen of the state of Texas is paying more to to you know as a as a result of this crypto mine e existing there now they'll tell you that's not true and they'll try to you know confuse you and do all sorts of stuff but that's just undeniably true you can ask anyone who has any sort of understanding of the energy um uh, inter industry um so if you believe like i do that crypto serves no useful purpose that at best it's zero sum and really it's sort of negative sum because of all the crime it facilitates and the environmental damage and et cetera et cetera if you believe that then you know, this is kind of ridiculous that it it is it is that it got so big that it's still around. Um, there's there's a group in Rockdale that's you know uh, you know uh, very much against this group of citizens, and they're you know protesting and 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 being very vocal online. I mean, I think that tells you everything you need to know. You're supposedly saving the city, and yet members of that city and that community don't want you there. Um, you know, I think finally, now that the price has gone down and some of the fraudsters are coming to light, we're seeing, you know, the more unpleasant side. But to go there and just to not sense that it was ever going away was 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 pretty frightening.
So shortly after y'all attended South by Southwest 2022, you actually went to the annual Bitcoin conference in Miami, which had pretty much every mover and shaker in the industry in Miami at that time. And then some from Peter Thiel throwing hundred dollar bills off the stage to Aaron Rodgers and a lot of people in between. And a seminal moment at the conference that year, which would have been last year, was an issuance of El Salvador's Bitcoin bond. But after the conference, you and Jacob, I believe, went to El Salvador, visiting everywhere from Bitcoin Beach to Bitcoin City and even the El Salvador Denny's. Despite El Salvador serving as an icon for Bitcoin bros, why is this uh, this country actually a good example of the perils of Bitcoin adoption? Yeah, that's a great question. So we did go to El Salvador, um, the only country in the world trying to use Bitcoin as real money. And it was a fascinating um, exercise in sort of the rubber hitting the road and the reality of what crypto does in real life, or, or maybe more to the point, doesn't do. Um, the pitch in El Salvador was pretty simple. This young guy, this sort of crypto bro president who would like, you know, take to the stage wearing a backwards baseball cap, uh, Naib Bukele, he sort of all of a sudden the previous year in the summer of 2021 said, we're going to, El Salvador is going to accept uh, Bitcoin as legal tender in three months in September. We're going to build this system called the Chivo, Chivo which means cool in, uh, in, in slang in Spanish. Um, we're going to build the system on top of Bitcoin. And basically the pitch is uh, you can use it to send money back home for remittances. And there's two to three million people of Salvadoran descent that live in the United States. The money they send home is the foundation of the economy, I would argue. It's like 25% of the economy. You're talking about a, you know, a fairly poor country. The average Salvadoran makes about $400 a month. Um, and so they need that money from their relatives and, and people are sending money back home through you know, MoneyGram and Western Union. And the pitch from Bukele was, well, we can avoid all that. You won't have to pay the fees. The government will take a tiny piece of the volume. It'll be a win-win, which, you know, look, like most things with crypto, it sounds good. <laughs> sounds great. Well, what happened? The day it, the law went into effect, the price of crypto crashed, which is fascinating. Uh, if you consider that it's somewhat unregulated market, it might've been front running anyway, crashed. Uh, the system failed like repeatedly all over the place. Uh, Salvadorans were given $30 worth of Bitcoin. Like everyone was just given this to sort of like encourage them to, uh, to use the system. A lot of people had their IDs ripped off. Somebody used their dog to like get the 30 bucks because the system was so you know, dysfunctional. Um, so what happened? Basically, nobody uses it. Uh, less than 2% of remittances use Chivo. But what it, and that's the government's own figures, you can check me on that. But but really, and it's being ignored by the, the vast majority of the populace who, you know, it's it, El Salvador's dollarized. So the 70% of the country doesn't have a bank account. 70% of the economy is conducted in cash. Um, and that hasn't changed with, with crypto. Um, they, these folks don't have money to gamble with, so they need every dollar they have. They're not going to like, they're not going <laughs> to gamble with crypto. What crypto is useful for is, um, you know, criminal activity, like money laundering. Um, it's useful for the drug trade, some of which runs through El Salvador. So, you know, corruption is not new in El Salvador, but Bukele um is an interesting character. And I think crypto was def definitely helpful for him to, to sort of, Encapsulated too, Bukele um, has basically declared martial law in the country. And El Salvador now sports the highest murder rate and the highest incarceration rate in the world. And it's also the only country, you know, that's trying to use cryptocurrency. So if crypto is this emancipatory new form of currency, it's awfully inconvenient that it's also the country where everybody's getting jailed. Um, that could be, you know. Correlation is not causation, but it's um, it's it's an unpleasant fact that I think crypto boosters should keep in mind when, um, well, I think we should keep in mind when crypto boosters are talking to us. Yeah, much like with the crash, I feel like that is, uh, like you, is more synchronistic than coincidental there. Now, you also interviewed Sam Bankman-Fried uh, before he was taken down by the feds, before he and FTX were taken down by the feds. Hilarious picture that you include in the book, by the way, the uh, the awkwardness there. But what was that like to speak with him and what really resonated with you about that conversation after the fact? It was one of the strangest hours of my life. Uh, I mean, the title of that chapter is The Emperor is Butt-Ass Naked. 
Um, <laughs> I was just like, surely, because at this point, you know, we'd gotten to, this is just a few more, a few months after South by the summer, we had gotten to what was at least being pitched as the pinnacle of the crypto industry, um, which it will shock you, has somewhat of a pyramidal structure uh, in, re in reality. <laughs> um, so we worked our way to the top and I'm thinking, well, if anybody can give me a good answer as to what crypto does, it's got to be this guy. I mean, this guy's being pitched as, you know, Sam is all over TV. Uh, celebrities were shilling for FTX. He was on Capitol Hill. He was having his ass kissed by everyone, really. I figured he's got to be able to give me some satisfying answers. And he just couldn't. I mean, to basic questions like give me one company, give me one coin project that does anything. And he hemmed and hawed. He talked about remittances. I just come from El Salvador, obviously. And I was like, you know, bullshit. And then uh, he mentioned a, a coin called Solana uh, or a blockchain slash coin. And the blockchain shut down all the time. It's like not worked over a dozen times. And he happened to own a lot of it to the point where it was jokingly referred to as one of Sam's coins. So I thought that was awfully convenient. Um it was a strange experience, man. And it left me feeling again, sort of like Mashinsky, that guy interviewed at South by it, it left me feeling like, oh man, there's worse to come here. And sure enough, you know, he was arrested uh, uh, in the fall. So yeah, <laughs> there are no satisfying answers when it comes to crypto. It's really pretty much the emperor has no clothes. Was there something especially surprising to you about that takedown when it finally did happen? It was shocking to me how simple the whole scheme is alleged to have been. I mean, the scheme, as I understand it through the court documents, is Sam had these two companies, FTX was the exchange and Alameda Research was this supposed uh, market making firm. It was reality, reality more of like a poorly run hedge fund, but they were supposed to be separated, right? If you put your money on the exchange, you were there to trade crypto. You, But instead, what he's alleged to have done is instruct one of his lieutenants to change a single number in millions of lines of code, which created a secret backdoor where he could basically steal his customers' money. Um, so that's what you're talking about with crypto. Like when they say trust the code, <laughs> you know, code doesn't fall from the sky. People write code. And so you're what you're saying is you're trusting the people that write the code. But if those people are, you know, operating in a basically a a seemingly consequence-free environment, right? They're in the Bahamas in a penthouse and, you know, it seems like everything's going great. Then, you know, you're relying on some kid to have your best interest at heart, right? I mean, we'll see what happens with the court case, but it was really shocking just how simple, quite frankly, dumb the whole thing was. Um, I did not see that coming, but it, it's only fitting, I have to say, when it comes to crypto. You've obviously uh, acted in front of crowds for years now. Was it any more nerve wracking to testify in front of the Senate Banking Committee near the end of 2022 about this collapse? It really was. I mean, I had been sort of pushing behind the scenes to get a hearing um, to really show the other side of crypto because all you were getting in 2021 and even the first half of 2022 was the industry had given Washington so much money that there were these hearings where they would just be kissing the ass of whoever the uh, the crypto industry was putting forward, including Sam Bankman-Fried. There's some great clips of him. Uh, thank you, Mr. Bankman-Fried, for running a safe way of, I mean, it's like, oh my God. Um, so, you know, I've been pushing for, for months, but of course it only really came about once Sam, his empire fell apart. So yeah, to, to, to finally being able to get up there and deliver you only get five minutes to speak, but you can put in a longer piece of written testimony. Um, it was very satisfying. It, was, it felt like the culmination of a journey that had begun, well, actually where I'm talking to you from here in my tiny little office in Brooklyn, 600 square feet, um, and, and had gone all over the world. And then I'd sort of come full circle back to America um, to try to, you know, <laughs> desperately get someone, somebody in the power's attention. Um, it was a pretty surreal moment, but 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 also one that was, you know, deeply satisfying. So this book is so good from beginning to end. I mean, I'm having to, to cherry pick some moments right now to talk with you about, but it really is uh, the definition of a page turner, not just because you provide some great information and interesting stories from this uh, very seedy world, but you also do a great job of weaving in your own personal narrative in pursuit of information in the process I'm curious, 
is there maybe a plan down the road to try and do something like the big shorts uh, did with the uh, 2008 crisis? Because I feel like there is a ton of potential there. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny you should mention that. Yeah. I mean, I, I recorded a lot of these conversations on, on camera, so I'm, I'm putting together a documentary, um, which I think will be a comedy. I'm not sure. Yeah. Uh, dark comedy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Dark comedy. Um, and yeah, I mean, I'm open to all of that stuff. I, I think of, you know, I think of crypto, it's like subprime, but dumber. So it's like, uh, you know, if, if the big short were even more gonzo, I think that's what you'd get with, uh, with crypto, but yeah, let's, let's hope it happens. Well, in a fictionalized version of this story, who plays you? Oh, that's my favorite part. There is a character named Ben McKenzie, but he's played by Ryan Gosling. I think that's, <laughs> it's only fitting for my career, who, by the way, is fantastic as Ken in the new Barbie movie. I highly recommend it. Really. Oh, wonderful that, that movie is so good. I, I, haters going to hate, but come on guys, we're talking about a fantasy satire. What did you expect with uh, some of the outrageous ways in which they tackle certain issues? But the message in the end was a phenomenal one. That's such a good movie. I, I love it. I will, I will, uh, I will die on that hill. Uh, Barbie, one of the best movies of the year. Um, yeah, I look, man. Uh, I, maybe I play myself, but I, I, I honestly can't stop laughing about the idea of somebody else playing me. And maybe I get to direct them, and I'm like, no, 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 make me less cool. Like, you know, <laughs> you know, we're gonna have to, we're gonna have to make Gosling shorter. You know, we're gonna make him a little less pretty. Um, yeah, let's let's see. Hope I hope I can I hope I can make it happen. All right, last question, because you are uh, one of those people that Austinites love to embrace because you are an Austin native. How much of an Austin guy are you? Well, you played Texas high school football here for Pete's sake. So uh, even though you don't live here now, you obviously visit from time to time. Your parents still live here. What do you love about Austin? Oh, man, I don't even know where to begin. I mean, growing up in Austin was truly just a, it was an incredible childhood. I mean, yeah, I went to uh, Cassis Elementary, Austin High School, um, did, did manage to start uh, for the Maroons there and we made the playoffs only to get crushed in the first round, but Hey man, we, we were in the game. Um, I love, obviously I love the food. The food is incredible. I love the music. I just like, and I, I think Austin can hang on to this. I'm a little bit worried about it's losing a little bit of this, but just like the, the, the vibes, man. I mean, people are just nicer and and more chill and creative and there's a real sense of community um, and a real sense of energy with with UT there. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I love everything about Austin. I love going back. My, my folks are still there. But, um, yeah, it, it was just a, a magical place to grow up. Does that hatred for Westlake football still run deep? <laughs> well, you know, I grew up with Drew Brees. He and I were the same uh, class, and we went to uh, to middle school together. And then, of course, he went to Westlake and beat the living heck out of us. Um, but he's a, But he's a great guy. Yeah. And so, yeah, we, we occasionally text. I'm sure, I'm sure when I see him next, he'll, uh, he'll give me credit for it. He has been McKenzie, uh, an actor, Austin native, of course, and now a New York times bestselling author. The new book is easy money, cryptocurrency, casino capitalism, and the golden age of fraud. You can get it now wherever books are sold. Ben, thank you so much for the time today. And thank you for this book. Hugely important, uh, hugely informative, and also very entertaining at the same time. Man, I can't thank you enough, uh, Trey. This has been really, really fun. Thanks, man. Thanks to Gentleman Jesus for the intro and outro music. Hear more of his work at GentlemanJesus.com. Thanks to you for hanging out. For more of the show and to connect on social media, visit BooksOnPod.com. Talk to you next time on Books on Pod.